Good morning. Welcome to worship at University Evangelical Lutheran Church here in Gainesville, Florida, this third Sunday in Lent. We welcome especially those who are joining us as visitors and guests online, and we trust that you will continue to fellowship with us, even as we work towards meeting in person, depending on how the guidelines go. Let's take a moment to quieten our hearts and to draw our spirits to God as we begin to worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant and source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Let's pray. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, 
the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always and also with you. Share a sign of that peace with those around you or send a message to someone electronically right now. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Christ have mercy, Christ have mercy, Christ have mercy on us. For this holy house and all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy on us. Help, save, comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us read Psalm 19 together. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky proclaims its maker's handiwork. One day tells its tale to another and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands and their message to the ends of the world where God has pitched a tent for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can detect one's own offenses? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer.
according to John, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for, for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years. Can we raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Just a few weeks ago, Americans watched on in shock and horror as rioters stormed the Capitol building. Try to think about where you were when that happened, what emotions you had. Now imagine that instead of rioters, it had been a foreign military or a natural disaster or something that, was sh that would bring sure destruction to the building forever. And imagine that building was not just the Capitol building with all its political and social and, and cultural significance, but a building you thought was actually ordained by God. I know that's a lot to imagine, but if you can imagine it, you can start to understand what's going on in today's gospel reading. Because that's exactly how people viewed the temple at the time. And that's what makes Jesus' actions in the temple so shocking, so fascinating, and, and brings so much to learn from them. The temple for Jews of Jesus' period was as important to them as the White House, the Capitol building, or any other building in it, it, that you can think of in, in the United States is to us, and probably a lot more so. At that point, the temple was the place built, uh, built and ordained by God and the place in which God was going to come to dwell with his people. But things hadn't always worked out exactly as, as planned in that sense. The first temple was built by King Solomon. Before that, the, God had come to dwell in a tabernacle in the Ark of the Covenant. And here was a place in which God would come to permanently dwell, come to, to rest and to dwell with his people. That temple stood until it was destroyed in the, by the Babylonian Empire it, and the Jews put into the Babylonian exile in that period. The temple was eventually rebuilt, and by the time of Jesus, we're on the second temple. But the second temple, as far as many Jews were concerned, wasn't exactly the same as the first. And the book of Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, tells us in chapter 11 of this extraordinary scene where due to the idolatry and the iniquity of, of, of Israel, God decides to get up and leave the temple. The presence of God actually leads, leaves the temple in this extraordinary scene because of the, the Israelites bringing idols into the temple, worshiping false gods, failing to worship the one true God and to serve him. God decides to actually get up and leave. When the second temple is built, you can build the temple, but you can't make God come back to it. That's up to God to choose whether or not he decides to do so. And when we hear one person after another talk about the second temple, we don't ever hear them say that God has actually come back. We hear prophets like Ezra and Nehemiah say that the Lord will one day return to the temple, but nobody ever says that he actually has. The temple, nonetheless, is this place where God has come before and where they believe he will come again one day, but for some reason, he hasn't exactly come right now, at least not in the way maybe that he did before. And maybe there's reasons for that. Different people speculating. Perhaps we're not keeping the law well enough. Perhaps we're doing something wrong here. There must be some reason God hasn't come back to the temple. And surely Jews of Jesus' this day were saying, that's why the Romans are able to oppress us in this way, because God hasn't returned to the temple. If when on the day when God does return to the temple, surely that will be the day when the Romans are out of the way. They can no longer oppress us. We can live freely and simply worship God the way that we want to. But Jesus isn't quite happy with that picture of the temple either. 
and the way that the temple is developing is, uh, is in a way that Jesus isn't quite happy with. Jesus marches into the temple. He overturns tables and where people are changing money. He lets animals out of cages and, lets, and scares them off so that they run away. He disrupts this entire enterprise inside the temple. So how exactly did this temple system work and what exactly was Jesus disrupting here? Well, this, John tells us, is near the time of Passover in which Jews from miles away would all come to the temple to come sacrifice an animal and worship and pray to God in that way. However, they couldn't simply bring an animal with them from their hometown because they were coming from miles away. The animal might not survive the journey, and if it did, it may have become injured along the way, which would make it in impure and not a suitable sacrifice. Thus, it wasn't feasible to bring your own animal there, so you had to buy one there. So having animals for sale there was necessary at that point. Likewise, it was necessary to change money at these money tables because Jews did not want to use Greek or Roman coins because they had icons on them, icons of Caesar, which they considered to be idolatrous. Even the type of currency and the coinage they used was important to the purity of the sacrifice that they performed there. So these institutions no doubt had abuses. Any human, any institution run by human beings will always have corruption and abuses. And there's no doubt that there was some here and some of the practices going on. However, the practice of selling animals and turning money was necessary for the temple to function. So the impact of what Jesus was doing here is not simply to eradicate a few abuses and let the temple system go on, but is to challenge the system at its core. Once the, once the animals are scared away, the tables are turned over, perhaps only for a short amount of time, but for a deeply symbolic amount of time, the whole temple system comes to a halt. The practice of sacrifices and worship and so forth that goes on in the temple cannot go on anymore without these animals being sold. Jesus does challenge the abuses of the temple, but he, but he brings the entire system to a halt along with it. This is what Jesus has, in a sense, done throughout his ministry. Jesus has acted in a way of doing, performing services and doing things that normally you would have to go to the temple to do. Jesus offers people forgiveness. Normally, if you wanted forgiveness, you would go to the temple and make a sacrifice. But Jesus tells people he can give them forgiveness just on the streets. In modern terms, this would be like somebody coming to you on the street and offering to give you a driver's license or a passport. You'd say, no, surely I've got to go to a government office. You can't just give me a, a driver's license or a passport. But that's exactly what Jesus was offering to do. And if somebody did offer to give you a driver's license or a passport, you would surely think that they are challenging the actual legal institutions that give out those things. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing. By offering to give out forgiveness on his own, he was challenging the way you normally got forgiveness through going to the temple. And of course, many leaders of Jesus' day were not totally happy about that. Why was Jesus challenging it in this way? Well, because as far as Jesus was concerned, People were looking at and treating the temple in the wrong way. The temple was never supposed to be the ultimate thing. The temple was always supposed to be a signpost. Those of you who are pet owners can probably think of a time in which you've wanted to show your pet something and so you've pointed at it. And the pet, instead of looking at what you're pointing at, actually just looks at your finger and looks at the sign instead of what the sign is actually pointing at. That's the idea of what's going on here. The temple is a sign. It's pointing to something else. It's not the thing in itself. But people are so preoccupied looking at the sign that they don't see what the sign is actually pointing to. So then a sign, which is a good thing in itself and a necessary thing, can become a bad thing when it becomes the ultimate thing rather than what that thing is actually pointing to being the ultimate thing in that sense. That's exactly what was happening with the temple in Jesus' day. As far as Jesus was concerned, the temple itself had become the ultimate thing, rather than looking what the temple was prefiguring, what the temple was pointing to, and so on and so forth. The idea of God coming to dwell in the temple was always, in a sense, a temporary thing. The ultimate thing which God promises to do is to fill the entire creation with his glory. We hear this line several times in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, in the book of Isaiah, other places, that the entire earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. How do the waters cover the sea? 
The waters are the sea. That's how ubiquitous God promises to make his presence in the new creation, in the new heavens, in the new earth. And that is anticipated, that is prefigured by God coming to dwell in the temple. But that doesn't mean God coming to dwell in the temple is the final state, the ultimate thing we're looking to. That was a temporary thing meant to prefigure what was ultimately coming. And when Jesus comes, the temple's time in that sense has come as well, because Jesus presents himself as the new temple. Jesus comes and is challenged on what he has just done. He's asked, what sign can you show us to show you have authority to do this? And John here is engaged in a little bit of a wordplay. When, when he's asked about giving us a sign to show you have the authority, what they mean is a warrant. In the same way that if a police officer came to our house today, we would want to see a search warrant before we let them search our house to know that you actually have the authority to do this. That's what they're asking of Jesus. Show us a sign. Show us you have the authority to do this. Jesus answers in a different way. He, he gives a sign in the, in the sense of a revelatory act. Not in the sense of of, of a warrant, of of something showing he has the authority to do this. Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll build it back up again. What on earth are you talking about? It took 46 years to build this temple. You're not going to build it again just in three days. But of course, nobody understood exactly what Jesus was talking about at the time. John tells us it's only after Jesus' resurrection that he and others realized Jesus meant the temple of his own body. Jesus himself had become the temple now, the place where God's presence had come to dwell. People were wondering when God would return to the temple. God's presence had left in that incredible vision in Ezekiel. When would it come back? This is how it's coming back in Jesus. Jesus is saying, I am the answer to that. I am the dwelling presence of God who has come to return to his people. But even that, Even that is not the ultimate thing. Even that is still a signpost in some sense. Jesus tells us that after he leaves, once he goes to be with the Father, he will send the Helper, the Holy Spirit, to be with us, who comes to abide with us and to be God's presence with us. That is a further signpost that goes on right now. And even that is still prefiguring, still anticipating that ultimate vision of the entire earth filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So that today, right now in the present, when two or three of us meet together in the power of the Spirit, we are anticipating and prefiguring what will happen on that day. Paul says in his letter to the Colossians, Christ in you, the hope of glory. When you have Christ in you, when you have the Holy Spirit, and dwelling you, and being with you, and meeting in the power of the Spirit, that is all anticipating that hope of glory, of the glory of God, in dwelling and filling the entire creation. And we can never forget that all the signposts we have right now, as important as they are, as vital as they are, are just that, signposts, pointing to something forward not the final result in themselves. That's the lesson Jesus wanted to show to people of his day. It's the lesson we would do well to continue to learn in our day. So, as you continue going about your business, as you continue to meet in the power of the Spirit, to seek after God, remember that every time you are doing so, you are prefiguring, you are anticipating that final day, when the entire earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea.
through our baptism into Christ, living together in that trust and hope we confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. There is no God before you. Purify the faith of your church, that your people place their trust in nothing beside you. Your name is holy. Guide the church that in every situation, your people's words and actions Honor your name. Hear us, O oh God. The mercy is great. Your foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. Fill lead us with the foolishness of your grace and mercy. Your law defends the vulnerable. Work through legislators, judicial systems, and systems of law enforcement to protect the well being and freedom of all. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Your, your weakness is stronger than human strength. Protect those who are vulnerable and give courage to all who are suffering, especially those we name out loud or silently. Defend victims of crime and bring redemption to those who have harmed others. Give Sabbath rest to all who labor. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. The cross of Christ is your power for all who are being saved. Thank you for all the matters whose witness reveals the power of the cross. Give us the same trust in life and in death. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You have not fed us with bread alone, but with words of grace and life. Bless us and this, your gifts, which we receive from your bounty through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray together as our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done 
on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. A few announcements from the parish before we close today. We'd like to wish those who have birthdays this week a very happy birthday. We celebrate with you the life that God has given you and that you share with us. Let's continue to hold each other in prayer. I know many people have been asking about when we will meet in person now that many have the vaccine. As you know, not everyone has it. But we are exploring different ways that we may be able to connect. We rely on the guidelines of the CDC and the COVID advisory group here at UELC. I'd like you to note that recent advice coming from the scientists in the CDC is that we could face a spike if we relax the guidelines as it was before the vaccine rollout. So stay tuned for advice uh, from our COVID-19 advisory group, you will be informed accordingly. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, free to serve your neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. Go in peace, share the good news. Thanks be to God.